Ryman. I am going to talk on that topic, but I'm starting with this image here. Um, it may look kind of odd to you, particularly an engineer. <laughs> um, so I guess I'd like to hear uh, for a prize. Now, I, I don't expect anyone to win this prize, but I'm, I'm going to throw it out there. I, um, I, I've been engaging AI. Anybody heard of AI? Artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence. <laughs> really need Pedro back in the room. Yeah. Um, and, and I've been using it uh, productively, actually. Uh, this was a not so productive interaction I had with it. But I defined a concept that we engage in pest management. And I asked it to produce me a picture. And this is the picture. One of many, but this is the picture it gave me. And so for a prize, this is a puzzle. It's a brain teaser. You got to get lubricated here for this talk. Um, what concept is being, uh, or phrase or term is being represented by this um, AI generated image? Yeah, I'll be amazed if anybody even gets close to this. Any guesses? Population thresholds? That's a good guess. It's not correct. Okay. Good Integrated task management. No. <laughs> guess. Good contextual guess. Anybody else? Decontamination. Decontamination. Yeah, that's kind of an interesting one. Pesticide All right. safety. Huh? Pesticide safety. Pesticide safety. Okay. And we're, we're we're getting we're you know we're going from cold to warm. <laughs> that's good. It's central. Huh? Pest control. Yeah. PPE. Huh? PPE. PPE. No. Getting cooler again. Um, death, death to the pest. Oh, well, that's, that's, that's getting warmer. <laughs> lethal dosage. Yeah, lethal dosage. All right. So obviously it didn't do such a good job. I wasn't happy with this image. I don't think it communicated uh, transparently enough what the concept was. And I was frustrated by that because it should be able to do just what I wanted to do, but I couldn't get it to do that. But there are other people that are, have thought about these things and, and drawn up much better conceptual drawings. Now this is a human generated drawing that I borrowed uh, from the internet. I didn't draw this, but you can read it and see it. I still haven't told you what the concept is though. So. No. So read that and tell me what you think the concept is for a prize. Selectivity. Selection for resistance. Resistance. <laughs> resistance. We're all around it, but that's still not the term that I gave initially to the AI engine. Those are definitely helpful guesses. Really to beneficial? Not precisely, no. Now I'm thinking of a classic term, and when I say it, hopefully most of you will say, yeah, I've heard someone talk about this phrase or term before in pest management. Biological control? No. Target? Something about Target. doing the same thing over and over again. That's very, you need to listen to what she just said. Did you all hear that? <laughs> like doing something say, over and over and over, over again. Resistance What's management, life cycle management, management. life cycle management, life cycle. You're, you're you're getting into a familiar territory here, but what, what's what's something we do over and over and over again? What do we think about when we do things? Life cycle. cycle. Yeah. Repetitive. You're gonna groan when I tell you. I know it's gonna go. It's on the front page of every. All right, I'm gonna give it to you. The pesticide treadmill. Okay, the pesticide treadmill. Now, the AI didn't do so good with that image, but this no. is a pretty good image, right? And it tells us you develop a new pesticide, you apply the pesticide, most of the pest dies, some are, become resistant, the proportion of resistant individuals increase, you apply a pesticide again with little or lower result, and ultimately you have to develop a new pesticide. That's the pesticide treadmill. Anybody, how about, I'll, I'll give another prize, okay? Who might know who was the first entomologist to coin this term, or at least it's ascribed to him? Anybody know? Anybody Thomas know their Edison. entomological history? Huh? Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison, that goes a little farther back. A non prominent entomologist. In 1968, the silent spring lady. No, no Rachel Carson. Carson, that would be a good, a good guess. No, a little earlier. No, nobody. That's no, 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 no. 
problem. It was Robert Vanden Bosch, okay? He was in the UC system, a prominent entomologist and um, advocate for biological control, um, much despised, honestly, by the pesticide industry, especially when he published this book in 1968, The Pesticide Conspiracy. Okay. It's worth reading. This is the subtitle, if you can't read it, an alarming look at pest control and the people who keep us hooked okay. on deadly chemicals. All right. Uh, a rather sobering indictment of the industry of the time. It really was. And uh, I'm sure there'll be people, we have people from that industry, the legacy of that industry here with us today. I'm not, not here to insult you today. It's not the same industry it was in 1968. Uh, but there were things that happened that really, um, really, uh, really stuck in, in Robert Vanden Bosch's uh, craw, as they say. And then he came up with this term, pesticide treadmill. Um, but if, if you follow it, some of you said it resistance, it kind of has its basis in resistance. That's, you know, the book isn't about resistance. It's not about the pesticide treadmill. It's about the pesticide conspiracy. It's a good read. There are a lot of good um, stories in there, it's tragic stories as well. But the pesticide treadmill was coined by him in that. And uh, it has expanded ever since. I couldn't find a more contemporary drawing that reflects this. I know it's in published work. Um, because you'll hear people talking about some of these other things like child said selectivity, and yeah, that's exactly right. You now see it applied more generally to pest management when someone says the pesticide treadmill, they're not always referring to resistance. And so, you know, you really have to couch it in the frame of, of the time. In 1968, all we had were non selective chemistries, insecticides. So it was about development of non selective insecticides, applying non selective insecticides where you killed the pest plus most of the arthropod natural enemies that were present. And that left you some pests and usually very few natural enemies. So they weren't really helpful at all. And that resulted in the need to apply another non selective pesticide in order to control the pest. So now this brings into that. Uh, into this discussion, that integration of chemical and biological control that we talk about so much. You may say, well, why the heck did Peter talk about that when he's supposed to talk about Thrive On? Well, it's related, right? This is very much a technological development of industry, the same industry that formed the pesticide conspiracy of the 1960s. Um, it's, it's an important new uh, trait, and, and I'll go over it fairly quickly because I think some of you are quite familiar with it. Um, uh, I, I, I think it's important to start with this theme of selectivity, all right? It's a selective technology along with all the other previous BT cottons for left control, all our uh, white fly and lagus insecticides that are selective and safe to beneficials now, uh, such that we, we really do make use of natural enemies and can use them more efficiently. I won't talk about the predator thresholds as much, but on a lot of literature in the back, um, I would encourage anybody that walks cotton fields to, to learn about our predator thresholds and deploy them. We're going to concentrate here in our IPM pyramid on tolerant and resistant varieties. Um, obviously, uh, IPM is, is uh, the appropriate mixture of control tactics and knowledge to, to, uh, that, that has a foundation in avoidance, but we do still use chemical controls. It's just the nature of them are quite different, and we're always looking for selectivity. So uh, Thrive On is a resistant variety, probably should be more, well, depending on the target, it should be referred to as a tolerant variety or a resistant variety. And we'll talk about the contrast there. I do, I did put out a, a piece um, a while back and not many people paid attention to it at then because they were getting seed contracts and they were given the seed for free and they weren't really purchasing it. Now there are people who are purchasing it openly and they really wanna know how it fits in their system. Uh, if you go to the QR code, you can grab this. I have a few copies on the back there if you want it. It's just a piece with frequently asked questions about Thrive On. Uh, it, it originates here. It, it, it's a, it's a produce, it comes from a bacterium. Uh, they, they have these cryptic names, Cry51AA1. Uh, that's just the name of the protein that this uh, living organism, a bacillus thuringiensis bacterium, produces. That's what was harvested and the genetic information placed into um, cotton is what it looks like, which I think is pretty easy to know what it looks like, uh, and put into a plant. Uh, years in testing, I think this is my 13th year of testing it in many different ways. Uh, really interesting technology. Um, so what will it control? Well, it controls two things principally, ligus bugs, 
and thrips, specifically Franklin yellow thrips, all right? Those that are in the genus Franklin yellow, and for us, that means Western flower thrips. That's the only member, really the only thrips. member of Franklin yellow we have in Chicago. So it does help with ligus control, but let's start with thrips. So here's the life cycle of thrips, just um, a reminder, it's not an insect we scout too often or think about too much, too much in cotton, but obviously very important in the produce industry. Starts out with an egg that's inserted into leaf tissue. There's a first instar, second instar, they're active feeders. Then it uh, go, drops down into the soil and there's a pre-pupa and pupal non-feeding stage. And then you get the adults coming out of the soil. So this organism depends on the soil. So uh, there was some outstanding research done at North Carolina State University by a colleague of mine named Anders Husseth. He's, he's kind of our thrips expert, but why? Um, did wonderful studies to show that there was impacts on adults, um, survivorhood to adulthood of, of the thrips and how long they lived and how big they are. But here's, here's the take home, none of that matters. This is what matters. Um, and, and why do I say that? Because now that we've gotten it out into real people's fields and we've collected real thrips populations from across the cotton belt, in particular here in Arizona, because we participate in that program for Western flower thrips, we've discovered that in fact, these effects aren't showing up in the thrips that we collect in the fields from Arizona. Don't know why, but his field, his lab colony of Western flower thrips were more susceptible to this gene and they reflected reductions in, in, um, in survivorship to adulthood and, and, and smaller thrips. He's not seeing that effect on the ones we collect from real fields here in, in real cotton fields. So, but this is main, this is still true. And it's really the main way this works. And it makes it a very curious protein to interact with an insect because it's perceiving the protein in the PT thrive on cotton and, and then avoiding or even refusing to lay eggs into it. So it's kind of short circuiting the whole life cycle, right? If you don't have Thrips depend on plants for reproduction. That's where they lay their eggs. They don't lay the eggs in the soil. Yeah, Jesse. So that, you got my, my mind going here. So he used the lab colony to generate these data. Initially, pre-registration, when all this was being developed, yep. So the data you're showing there, um, you said it doesn't apply very well to here. Does it also apply well to their uh, commercially in North Carolina where they're dealing with- a different species. Populations. Different species different effects. In fact, um, this, this BT is more potent on Western flower thrips than it is on the, on the uh, Franklin yellow they have back east, but it's a different dynamic. I'm only showing you the Western flower thrips specific information, which means only information that came from Arizona, really. So, so I guess what my question is, does his data apply better to their system? He has two sets of data, one for Western flower thrips and, and, and one for the other Eastern Franklin yellow species. His data is has has been consistent between lab and field. Okay. That's your question. Yeah, that's inconsistent for lab and field in the West. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, you get what your flower trips in North Carolina. Two sets of data. One. Yep. Two sets of data. Yes. Two sets of data. And his what his initial colony probably came from local collections in North Carolina. Even though we call it Western flower trips, it is, you can find it across the entire cotton belt. All right, so focus on this because it's really about avoidance. So uh, a couple of years ago, I made this slide and I have all this sort of uh, dithered language. Don't even read it. Here's the answer. Should I spray chemically or should I control chemically control thrips? No, you shouldn't. You shouldn't. And it's very rare to get an entomologist, especially an academic one, to say something so definitively. But, um, and it's even more rare for all entomologists beltwide to have a consensus on this, but they do. Uh, in fact, I don't remember a single thing that we agree on completely across the belt until this fact. Um, there's been many trials run in much heavier thrips pressure than we can generate here in Arizona. And at no time has it ever gained any benefit, any real benefit, let's call it control benefit, by adding a seed treatment for thrips control, adding an infero spray for thrips control, or adding a foliar spray on top of drop on cotton. There's been no benefit. So there's really no economic incentive for the grower to spend money if he doesn't need to spend it. So I'm not a seed expert, 
Can this, you, you mentioned, you know, obviously Western polythrips in, in our veggie crops. Is this trait being researched in those crops yet? You know? I wish it were. You know, honestly, when I started my career here 32 years ago, and we were just, I had just witnessed the first planting outdoors of a transgenic cotton plant at the, at the Big Mac farm. And I was putting out my first trials in 92. I thought, oh, over my career, we're going to see all these unbelievable biotech advances and all the, all the food crops, fresh fruits and vegetables that we depend on. Has any of that been realized? <laughs> so I don't know the answer specifically, but I could almost guess with a guarantee that no, nobody's thinking about putting this in lettuce or anything else, even though it might be a sensible thing with, with the disease, diseases that the same species transmits right. the lettuce, right? INSF, INSV. Yeah. Sadly, um, yeah, that's not where it's gone, right? And you can almost understand it. If you're trying to market something that costs hundreds of millions of dollars to develop, uh, something to oh, like 40 to 80,000 acres of, of lettuce versus whatever, 12 million acres of cotton. Yeah, it's the broad acre crops that are, that are getting it, but the consumers also has impacted this. Yeah. Good question. All right, so um, Scott Graham is a young extension entomologist at Alabama at Auburn. Very good. Um, his father's been in the industry for years. He's a good entomologist. And he, shared, uh, he shared this slide with me uh, at meetings that I had with him. I said, oh my gosh, I'm gonna have to have it. I said, this is a slide you will be showing 32 years down the road if you're still in this career because you're just never going to see something so dramatic as this. This is two rows of cotton. Uh, Delphine 2131, which has the Thrive on in it. The T tells you, TXF. And then 1646, the nearest neighbor relative to that genetics. And, and that's in this row. Well, it's crazy, right? This is nuts. Uh, this is severe, severe, severe thrips pressure. This is a blow up of it taken on the same day. Um, all the nodes, you know, it's amazing the plant is alive, honestly. All the nodes have been knocked down, knocked out and compressed, and the Thrive On looks good. You know, they're still feeding. You can still, under this extreme pressure, you can identify, an entomologist can see some feeding injury there. It makes sense. They have to perceive the BT in order to avoid it. Um, but that's just extraordinary. Even for Auburn, they had never seen densities like this. These densities were about in the range of 100 to 200 thrips per plant. Now, when I do my typical studies here in Arizona on thrips, you know, we get excited if we get one or two thrips per plant. So this is easily 100 times heavier. So anybody know who this guy is? Anyone old enough to know who this guy is? Like a famous chef. No one who's seen the talk before, though. I know there's a couple of you. Anybody for a prize? Popular figure. Look at the clues back here. Nobody. Give us a hint. I know someone's at least older. Colonel Sanders. Huh? Colonel Sanders. Yeah. Well, he sold millions of these things, along with a lot of other things. Chicken roaster thing. That, yeah, that's what he sold. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and that's what he said. It was Ron Popeil. Yep. And he said, set it and forget it, right? Set it and forget it. It's just a, a great hook line. He sold millions of those rotisseries and other things. And, and honestly, if, you, if, if your interest is in thrips control, which I would first of all question in cotton in Arizona, where they're not a principal pest, but if that's your interest, it really is set it and forget it. Buy your seed, plant your seed, forget about thrips. You're not going to need to do anything. Is it the same way for ligus? <coughs> no, not, not really. Not exactly. Much more nuanced here, okay? It does reduce their impact, and we're still studying exactly how that's working. And, and, and I'm hearing and reading things in the trade journals that aren't accurate, so you got to be careful where you get your information. Um, but here is a plot of ligus nymph days. Think of it as like accumulated heat units. You know, your heat units accumulate through the year. This is the same way of counting your bugs and then accumulating them through time. And this is my control line, okay? This is my non-thrive online. Here's my thrive online. So ligus are still there. 
right? They obviously are in that field, but at a much lower density. We hit threshold here on the control line. We hit threshold here, the same threshold, the conventional threshold here. So it delayed it by about a week. Uh, because of the protocol, we had to go ahead and spray. But the net difference there is about 40% fewer Ligus nymph days, okay? 40% fewer. Focus on that number because that's kind of the low end of what I've seen since. This is all done in our very carefully calibrated small plot trials. But now when we've gone, wrapped it up into half acre, uh, quarter acre, half acre plots and beyond, we've actually seen as high as 60%, 65% reduction in ligus nymph days. So at the bottom end, a 40% reduction in sort of the, the, uh, the activity of ligus in your field. So, um, do we need to control ligus to drive on co cotton? The answer is yes. You, like in anything, you'll have to scout it. And if they, it's not like thrips, it's not set it and forget it. There's still going to be uh, ligus there and you're going to have to consider them. So, um, you know, but it is a that depends things. It's, it's when do you need to do that, that, that spraying? And, and I guess it really does depend on the pressure on the field. Um, but uh, as a reminder to those of you that know or, or never knew, our standard threshold is 15 total ligus with four nymphs per 100 sweep, per 100 sweeps, up to 15 total ligus with eight nymphs. So four to eight nymphs is, is kind of our standard threshold. So certainly at or below 15, four, you should never spray Thrive on cotton. That's a hard no. Don't be spraying them when they're that low. You're, you, there's no sense in buying the technology. If you're be, somewhere between 15, four and 15, eight, I, you know, I say perhaps not. I'm going to pretty much say a hard no there too. You really shouldn't be spraying this at the conventional threshold. Now, what's odd here is you're gonna read trade magazines out of the South where they're saying they're using the same threshold that they were teaching growers before Thrive on Cod. That's just not our culture here, first of all. The culture there is such that they teach them a threshold and then the growers cut it in half and spray. Okay, and if you've been in Arizona long enough, 30, 40 years ago, that's kind of how we were treated too. The guidelines come out from the university and they say, ah, that threshold is no good. Let's cut it in half. Think about your alfalfa threshold, right? For decades, we were giving you a terrible threshold and Kyle and Simon's work showed that it was a much lower threshold. Uh, that's not true. I think we have very good subscription rates to our standard threshold, 15, 4, 15, 8. So no, um, we're not shooting for the conventional threshold. It's gonna have to be something higher. So let's talk about that. There's a very poor relationship between the presence of ligus at densities below four nymphs per hundred. Here's four nymphs per hundred sweeps. Think of 15, four. There's a very poor, there is no relationship between these levels of ligus and yield outcomes in bales to the acre. Well, that makes sense, right? Because that's below the economic threshold. And that's true if it's thrive on cotton or non thrive on cotton. But as soon as you creep over for, um, I don't have any, you know, so I don't have any Thrive On dots over here because in this trial, they never, they never got to that level. But our conventionals did. And as soon as you start tipping over the, that threshold, you start seeing a yield effect. Now, this is very high yielding cotton. Uh, so this, this was from last year's trials. Um, uh, pressure was what I would consider light yet we reached threshold, just barely reached tr threshold twice, and we sprayed twice in our non-thrive on conventional. So we sprayed twice, and we gave 5.6 bales. Great yield. In our non-thrive on where we didn't spray, we made, you know, 5.1 bales. So even at these high yields, there's benefits to be had in spraying, and, and the threshold works. We, we sprayed at 15.8 in this case. Thrive on, we never could get it at 15.8, never sprayed, and it made 5.6. This does two things for me. One, it reinforces to me that the threshold is good. The conventional threshold is good for conventional cotton. Uh, this kind of proves it. Thriven did no better, right? It did no better than spraying twice on threshold in our non, non uh, thrive on. Um, but at least up to this density, you know, we still just need to spray to thrive on. So, um, because that's an unsatisfying answer, because I still don't know what the threshold is, and we haven't done the definitive experiments yet. That was from our threshold trial from last year. Um, I went back to our, our original relationships between conventional cotton, thrips, thrips, 
Ligus nymph numbers, seasonal means, and yield outcomes. As you get more and more ligus in the field, you're going to get lower and lower yields. Makes perfect sense. It's a curvilinear response. And then I said, well, what happens if we change that mathematical relationship by 40%? Because I know I'm reducing the activity by 40%. That's what this curve represents. I've not measured that in Thrive On. It's a prediction. Now, if you're smart, like I know Ron is, he knows you're growing money and not cotton. And so it really doesn't matter what the yield curve looks like. It's what your revenue curves look like. Now, they're, they're similar, but they're even steeper for conventional cotton. And, you know, Thrive On, it's a little tough to, to, to put the revenue on there because I don't know how much the darn technology costs. And it would be a constant, right? You can barely bury it. You can't say I'm going to have Thrive On here and not here within a field. But maybe that's something we do in the, in the grand future. But nonetheless, pay attention to that revenue curve. Here's our standard threshold. And that's why it's our standard threshold because our, our revenue is maximized in this four to eight region, 15 total ligas of four nymphs to eight nymphs per hundred, right? It's very flat. That's as, that's as much money as I can make. If I spray any more, I'm just wasting money spraying. This is how far out that, that's flattened when you look at the Thrive On curve. And to me, this should be where our candidate suggested threshold should be. Something higher than our conventional threshold, but not infinitely high. And I think just in my sort of, um, and this is always dangerous, my gut feeling is I, I really think it's out here towards the edge of this box, which is like 14 nymphs per hundred. Okay. Now you say 15 total, I get to 14 nymphs per hundred. I only need one adult to get to that. That's true, but th it's really just um, that, that first number is really just to assure that you have reproducing populations in your field. You've got some adults going on. This is really about nymphs. Nymphs are doing the majority of the damage. I'm not gonna show you that data. Uh, well, I think 15, 14 is probably a good candidate. I just haven't been able to get a plot up to that yet and thrive on. I'm hoping this year I will. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Bruce. This may be a silly question. Thrive on, is it? Is it a proprietary product of one seed company? It is. Mm -hmm. So Man. all cotton can't have thrive on, on it. No, but they will license. They are willing to license and they have license to Next Gen America. So there are some Next Gen varieties that have, have the trade as well. I have been told uh, that there, there's others in development by other companies, though I've not Delta seen any of those yet. Huh? Well, Delta Pine is, is the one that has, the one that has it. Delta Pine is, is the one partnered uh, with Bear developing it in, in variety. So it's available, and I think, correct me if anyone knows, I think it's in, available in four or five varieties this year of Delta Pine. Yeah. Nobody had it. Hardly anybody had a seed meeting this year because of lack of acres and, and their lack of seed too. And most and most and most most of the acres that I'm that were planted, I understand, are some or they had a, somebody had a seed contract on. They didn't want they didn't seed they, contracts. They didn't want to grow eighty cents, eighty cent cotton. Yeah. Yep. So this is what I'm looking at, and I'll just say I'm not going to call out that person. I had one PCA last year say he let that thing ride, and he let it ride to about. 15 nymphs per hundred. And he said he couldn't take it anymore. And he went ahead and oversprayed it. Now, so we don't have a check strip, so we don't know what would have happened. So his nerves just gave out on him. Yeah, his nerves gave out. But I'm just impressed that he let it go that far because I haven't been able to get a population that high yet in my uh, in my trial work. Since we're not a bunch because, of drunks like we used to be years ago, you know, it's hard to let things go that far. Yeah. The Thrive On um, suppresses the nymph population. It does. Yeah. But it's probably really only killing first in stars. Right. Maybe not only second in stars. Mm -hmm. It's not a lot of mortality. What you have are slower growing animals that are out there longer in a vulnerable state. They're sickened. Mm -hmm. They're not feeding. They're not thriving. Mm -hmm. um, and, and therefore, they're susceptible to everything, I think. Mm -hmm. So I think conceptually, what sits behind this is your biocontrols work better, your weather works better. Your, your, your insecticides all work better. But what about influx from other fields, like a, like a seed alfalfa field? That what, about a, what about influx in the cotton from like a seed yeah. alfalfa field that historically yeah. develops a lot of ligus pressure? Yeah, we haven't seen that scenario yet. So we're, it's, we're, it's coming though, right? Yeah, oh yeah. 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 So our suggestion is you really shouldn't start thinking about spraying Thrive on until you're at least 15 total ligus with eight nymphs per hundred. And I, I think you might be able to ride it quite a bit higher. All right, how can we help out on this so that you can, you know, maybe feel better and maybe know something more? 
We don't have data on this, but it stands to reason if this is reducing the activity of NIMS, you should be seeing a reduction in the impact on fruit retention. Yeah. Here's your standard fr fruit retention curves that uh, Silvertooth and Randy Norton have developed and, and updated over the years. I'd say get a hold of one of those if you don't already use them. Here's the middle baseline. That's where you want to be. Yes, you always like more fruit, but even if you're in the middle baseline, that's an optimal place to be. Um, and if that's where you are, then you probably don't need to spray, even if the ligus are there. So as an example, if my if I'm tracking it, it goes up and down, which it ha that happens. The plant responds all the time. But if you're tracking right along that middle baseline and, and ligus are there and you're in Thrive on Cotton, I'd say don't spray. I'd say don't spray, uh, especially if you're not to 15.8 or, or so. But if you see something like this, you get to here and all of a sudden you have this precipitous drop and you're heading towards the lower baseline and your ligus numbers are high, I think you're gonna, I think high meaning over the conventional threshold. I think that's a signal to you that you probably could benefit from a spray. Eight or more. Yeah, at least eight well, and we and, and now we have some ligus materials that are that are pretty effective that aren't that aren't that don't upset the balance of nature like, exactly. like what we used the to have to use. Isn't as high, yeah. right? It's not like the original pesticide treadmill, right? So yes. Uh, however, uh, if, even if you have the same the same set of data and you have this precipitous drop, but your ligus numbers are low, you need to be looking for other causes because it's not ligus. It's probably something else that's happening to your fruit retention. Right, you've not done something right. The plant's not responding properly. But don't always blame fruit retention drops on ligus. There's other factors that can. You know. so another key question then is, you know, what's the impact on and safety on uh, for beneficials and natural enemies? And that's something we we did a three year study on, uh, and we have to start at this. And that is. Western Constitutes very much has a split personality in, in cotton. It has a dual role. It's uh, both a hero and a villain. Uh, and as, as the villain, it is a plant pest. We know it can feed on the cotton. It needs to feed on, on cotton. But you know what? It loves to feed on spider mite, spider mite eggs in particular. And it's a very efficient predator of spider mites. And it's probably doing a lot more work than you ever realize in your cotton fields. <laughs> um, so, you know, key pest. And we know this one is a yield limiting pest. You know what to do there. Here, these are sec this is a secondary pest, and this is a secondary pest that rarely gets sprayed anyways in Arizona. But you can imagine with all these interactions going on, you know, there's also this opportunity for thrips to feed on mite eggs, but also on white fly eggs. And they are the earliest colonizers of our cotton fields. So we really want to uh, make sure our key predators aren't being upset by these. And our research shows that Thrive On has been safe on all the key predators, as well as our other predators that we've studied uh, in the Arizona system. So that's the good news. The bad news is, you know, we call these non-targets uh, in, 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 uh, in entomological parlance. They're the non-targets of the technology. Well, here you have one that's a predator that's actually a target of the technology, right? So we have to be thinking, are we reducing the biological control potential here of spider mites and white flies by using Thrive on Cotton? And that was a key question we were trying to answer. Uh, at least so far, we, we were unable to witness a resurgence of either white flies or a secondary outbreak of mites in our Thrive on Cotton. And we tried hard to bring about those conditions. And the reason we think is because this, our food web is so dense and, and, and populated with so many actors here that they're taking up the slack, they're taking up the slack. But I would say, you know, it's, there's still a caution there, right? We get this out on thousands of acres. Maybe you introduce a broad spectrum insecticide early on, which I advise against, you know, that dimethylate spray, whatever it is, that could be, you could be putting another domino in the chain that leads to a mite outbreak. So we focus a lot on this. Here's the adult Western flowers, but here's the larva, okay? And here's the spider mite egg. This is the bruising you see on the upper side of the leaf. The colonies are on the underside of the leaf. They produce webbing. And this is a shot I took. I was out with Karen a couple of years ago in a field. It was actually a conventional field adjacent, immediately adjacent to Thrive On. And we found spider mite colonies. We found the webbing. But then you search through here, it's, you know, it's a shot through my lens, it's not too close, too sharp, but there's actually one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, Fripp's larvae on there. 
and no mites in that mite colony. And so those larvae are engorged. They've, they've totally cleaned it out. Okay. So this is a powerful biocontrol lesson. Um, thrips are, for the most part, beneficial in cots. Uh, another QR code that you can grab if you want on, on uh, some of our some of the things I've talked about so far. We move on though. Natural enemies is a core tactic. Natural enemy conservation is a core tactic of what we're trying to do, and uh, that makes sense, right? Because we know if we use broad spectrum insecticides, we're threatening the stability of the system, and that's that was no clearer than when we, when we introduced carbine in two thousand six. Up until 2006, acetate was the number one active ingredient in use in Arizona. Number one by far. They put they put mites in, in the in the container. Well, that's what they say. Yeah. <laughs> that's what they say. It was a good ligus control agent. I, there was nothing wrong with the, the thinking of the people at the time. They didn't have a not a selective option. Carbine was the first one that supports our natural enemy co conservation. This is a witness to it, right? Here's a demo we put out, replicated demo. Here we sprayed acephate and we just blew out the mites and the white flies. Defoliated the cotton completely where we use carbine, which is back here and where we use transform, which was here. No problems at all. Those are selective agents right down to the row. This tells us that this biocontrol is happening all the time whether you ever consciously depend on it or not. Let me skip through this. If you wanna talk about uh, the predator thresholds, I've put out a series of publications on these. They really do work. Um, I've talked with a couple of people today that are actively using these this past year and have been quite happy with them. Uh, and I'll finish uh, on, on sort of the pesticide side of, the side of this. We produce just a two page thing. You can get it from this QR code. This is our cotton insecticide use guide. Here it is, green, yellow, and red, which tells us the selectivity of the compounds in the table. From our own, our own trial work, it's either fully selective, partially selective, not selective. That tells you whether it's safe. So we have the all these guys, green the, the bad guys are down at the bottom. What's that? The bad guys are down at the bottom. That's true. They're still tools, you know, you might have to use. We have efficacy ratings on there on a starred system. We also tell you about other ecotox risks that every grower should know about. We want to protect our communities. But here's here's the bottom line. We've since 2006, Arizona cotton growers are using selective insecticides far outnumbering broad spectrums. This is a, these are zero, almost zero lines here for our broad spectrum. We have less people to educate because we don't have as many people growing. That's true. That's sort of represented here in this room, isn't it? Yeah. So, you know, if we've had a lot of gains, right? Chlorpyrifos used to be important, methylparathine, not even used anymore. Uh, Azafate, we talked about, edisulfan, Vidate, all good products, but all broad spectrum. Not, almost none of that's in use anymore since carbine and transformer registered. We have lots of, of, uh, of white fly insecticides that are now selective, starting with the IGRs all the way to the present day subpoena and PQZ. Uh, and, and if we chart rubber adoption of selective compounds through time, the percentage of acres that are adopting, there's a straight line up. up Uptake. In other words, more and more and more growers are using more and more selective technologies on their acreage. Yeah, their PCAs are recommending more selective ones also. They, they probably go together. Absolutely, they go together. We have a very professional industry. We have uh, great chemistry in the green box, lots of modes of action for Wi Fi control. We had one and two modes of action in carbine and transform. Thrive On is going to be an adjunct to this. You're not going to, you know, Stop spraying drive on, you're going to still need carbine and transform and it's and it'll help us in our resistance management. I show this chart each time just as a reminder of where we've been 10, 12, 14 sprays per season, down to last year, just over 1.5 sprays remain for all of our bond pests, 90% of that being non uh, being fully selective materials. So what we have done as an industry oh my is flip the pesticide treadmill, right? Because, you know, actually we met this, this winter with PCAs from all over the state. And we talked about what happened last year. I said, what was the insect pressure like last year? And almost to a one, there was a general consensus that last year was the lowest insect pressure they'd ever experienced in their history. And we had at least one guy with practically 50 years of, of field experience. I think that I, I was that guy. Well, <laughs> I'm not going to give it away. 
So I, started, I started in 72. So how many years is that? Yeah, Do the math. All right. All right. 51. You uh, don't have to buy beer then. And you know, the, the next logical question for these PCAs was, well, why was that? Why were the numbers so low last year? And I say, well, at least in part, I think it's because you as an industry, PCAs growers together have flipped the treadmill and run it in reverse. And it does run in reverse. It's, it's, it starts here, you know, with resistant varieties and, and other selective technologies, apply selective sprays, your target pests are reduced such that your predators can now assist and control. And the ratios of pests to natural enemies favor natural enemies, so you can depend on them more and on the pesticide less. That means fewer and fewer sprays are needed for pest control and fewer pests and more beneficials are, are produced for the next following year or crop or season. It's really a classic reversal that um, is almost unprecedented, honestly, as an industry. It's not talked about enough. I want to tell a humorous story here. Uh-oh. Famous grower that I've had for a long time used to tell me, we ain't spraying until July 15th, no matter what. We ain't, it just flat ass ain't happening. I'm, my God, I'm not spending the money. And so then one of the neighbor sprays, I've ever seen an airplane over there. Oh, whoa, 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 what's going on over there? Whoa, 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 you sure we ain't missing something over here? One spring, I had a hell of a helicopters were new, and I had them go up and spray about 500 acres right north of Buckeye with furidin early, and we were trying to control some stem nematodes, all right? And everybody thought we were spraying weevils. Well, we hoped maybe we would get some weevils, but and then everybody starts spraying <laughs> because they saw us. All start ringing. It's the old That's calendar the mentality, happened, you know. I, I, when I first arrived, and I predicted it was going to happen. My acres. I don't know if you remember Bob. I used to bite them. Now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we got weevils out here. We're getting eaten up here. I don't know if you know what you He said, "My instruction." He had a strip there. He said, "My instruction, my ag pilot is: you show up on the first Sunday after July 4th. And then you come every Sunday thereafter because it won't be a matter of if we're spraying, it's just what we're going to be spraying. Every Sunday, he had his ag pilot out. He told me that story. He was a great guy, by the way. And he, and he changed over time. Um, I'll, I'll wrap up by saying we, this is unprecedented. This is a list of highly hazardous pesticides, which we won't get into, of seven of them. We don't use them. Only a half percent of our acres even use them ever. And it's not by chance that we got here. It's because you as an industry have been all pulling on the same end of the rope for a very long time. And here's California. This is a log scale, by the way. California's going up over the same time. Yep. Access to this, more or less, to the same technology. Culturally, something's different here. And, and, and all the credit goes to the industry. There's the lines. California's still going up. Arizona's going down on these highly hazardous pesticides. I'll conclude by saying, you know, this is all about building resilience in the system. I know 80 cent, 80 cent cotton is great, but uh, when it comes back, you guys will be ready to exploit it. Very good. Any questions? I know we went a little bit over. Okay, we'll move forward with the next presentation. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Anna.